1956, Operation Red Wing in the Marshall Islands featured structural testing on a variety of aircraft, including the B-52 and B-47. The latter aircraft was oriented side-on to detonations for the first time. One heavy bomber project on Red Wing was concerned with the effect of gust and overpressure on an aircraft structure just after it had been heated by thermal. During these tests, thermal loads as high as 200% of design were recorded, along with gust loads which ran between 95% and 115% of design. These tests raised thermal design limits to 600 degrees Fahrenheit for the B-52 and 500 degrees for the B-47. Throughout the years, on selected weapons test operations, SAC aircraft and crews participated to refine operational procedures. Perhaps the most significant was the IBDA project on Operation Red Wing, where SAC crews of the 301st Bomb Wing flew simulated delivery and breakaway maneuvers above six weapon detonations ranging up to five megatons in yield. It is interesting to note the increased confidence of these crews on successive missions. On the first event, Crew timing errors resulted in one aircraft being two and one-half times further away from ground zero than scheduled. On the second event, this error was cut to seven seconds in time, or less than one-tenth of a nautical mile in distance. On the third event, the error was reduced to two seconds in time, and a negligible amount in distance. During ensuing missions, each aircraft was at the assigned spot in time and distance. On Red Wing also, a research and development air crew accomplished the first delivery of a megaton bomb by a B-52 bomber. During the hardtack operation in 1958, the B-52 participated in 14 missions without blast or thermal damage. Significantly, the bulk of these missions were oriented to produce side-loading effects to determine the B-52's capability for multiple delivery strikes, where blast and thermal loads could be received at any angle from weapons delivered by other aircraft. Throughout the period of atomic testing, the hazard of nuclear radiation peculiar to fission and fusion weapons received a great deal of attention. Since delivery aircraft need to be concerned only with the nuclear cloud aspect of radiation, this report will be limited to the cloud studies. In the earlier operations, drone aircraft penetrations established safe parameters for the manned fly-throughs during Operation Teapot in 1955, when Air Force pilots flew T-33s through atomic clouds over Nevada 17 minutes after the burst. The first megaton cloud penetration study was made in 1956 on Operation Red Wing. Manned B-57s made 27 fly-throughs, the earliest 20 minutes after detonation. These test results formed the basis for the safe separation times listed in the EWO. Additional penetrations by B-57s during the 1958 hardtack operation verified the Red Wing conclusion. Throughout the years of nuclear testing, field operations were closely tied in with laboratory and aircraft plant activity. To gain vital time, much of the effects experimentation was first simulated in the plant workshops and research facilities before proof testing in the field. After each operation, findings were checked and cross-checked. Data on yields and distances from the bursts were projected into effects measurements on untried weapon yields with results verified on ensuing operations. As experience and data were accumulated and methods were perfected, laboratory predictions became increasingly accurate. Thus, from the often lighted crucible of atomic test fire and attendant laboratory work, were collected the substantial array of results utilized to influence the planning of a safe route for you beyond the HHCL. This route planning, in turn, stems from a complex target assignment undertaking 
which began long before SAC headquarters issued its current EWO with your sortie number in it. When high-level target agreement has been reached, the Joint Chiefs of Staff assign SAC headquarters its quota of targets. Both targets and priorities are determined by national policy and the latest intelligence information. Shortly thereafter, the combat planners from the numbered air forces descend on Offutt Air Force Base to work out the target area allocations for each tactical unit. IBM computing units are utilized to work out this distribution, taking into consideration such factors as base location, type of aircraft, geographical area, and target priority. When all sortie planning throughout SAC is completed, the results are run through SAC headquarters IBM Center for a cross-check. It is during this runoff that precise weapon effects criteria and timing of all sorties are compared. Conflicts resulting from timing compression into the various launch options are adjusted. In films such as you are now viewing, as well as through specific briefings given you from time to time, you have been given an indication of how nuclear detonation effects concern you, the air crewman. For more detailed study, SAC's directives and manuals make this material available to you in various forms. All in all, the factors involved form an overwhelming mass of facts and figures. You cannot be expected to remember all the details, particularly beyond the HHCL, when you will be totally absorbed with the immediate pressing duties associated with your aircraft. So, it is reassuring to know that the documents in your combat mission folder stowed aboard your aircraft represent solid results based on countless man hours of work done for you by the EWO planning personnel. you bore in past the HHCL. All six of you wrapped in this metal cocoon like a submarine crew beneath the sea. For the next few hours, except for the pilot's glimpse of the passing countryside during low-level operation, your only contact with the world outside will be a sporadic wink of light, followed by a sharp jolt. Pilot, this is Nail over turning point number 12. Change heading to 061. Roger, zero, 061. Keep our course and timing right on the nose, boy. That weapon from Blue Cell is about to go down on that government control center off the left. I hope he clobbers their fighter field, too. Roger. Guess that makes the war official, man. Keep those curtains buttoned up. We get a shock wave in a few minutes. Navigator to pilot, all instruments okay. Seem to be 
operating normally. AW to pilot. Same here. Gunner to pilot. Shark. Put an alarm down here. Pilot, this is EW. I'm getting less GCI signals now. Pilot? Navigator. Descent point coming up. Hit the IP on the button approaching your target. Pilot, this is now up up point in five seconds. Four, three, two, one. Now to get that separation distance between you and the burst. You close your front curtain prior to the flash. The thermal heat builds up.
Now to get back to altitude and start the long road back. It seems like the long way around to get to your post-strike base, but you remember working out an interference problem here. If you were to continue on this heading, it would place you within seven nautical miles of the burst from a multi-megaton bomb scheduled about this time. You recall griping about your rerouting, particularly because this new heading takes you almost directly through the contaminated cloud of another bomb dropped 30 minutes ago. Like the rest of your crew, you are resigned to this lesser evil. From now on, the stage becomes less crowded as you move back toward the safe side of the HHCL. Yes, it could happen. If this nightmare situation ever materializes into grim reality, you may have a real bear by the tail. But at least, you are assured of escaping the nuclear effects of our own weapons. The years of testing and analysis have enabled SAC to evolve a workable plan for every sortie to and from the target area. You and each crewman of the Strategic Air Command can have this assurance as you rigidly follow your flight plan, especially the part marked beyond the HHCL.